Okay. Uh, hello to everyone. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, we know that the challenges out there are really many. Not only for you, for us too. <laughs> so, um, with great pleasure, I welcome you to uh, this one hour panel uh, under the title On Location and Beyond the Intangible Benefits of Film Commissions and Film Offices. And um, I'm proud, really, uh, to host with all of you from this city and from the festival, uh, Marco Cucco from Italy, Teja Raninen from Finland, Martin Kaff from Serbia, and Eleni Bujukalaki from uh, the beloved island of Creta. And the idea is that they will present themselves. Um, are you afraid now? No, 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 I can do it. <laughs> yeah. So, Martin Kuko from the University of Bologna, please just talk to us yes. about you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for being here. My name is Marco Kuko, and I am associate professor at the University of Bologna in Italy, where I teach cultures of film production, and I am the head of a postgraduate master program in film management. Uh, my research inter interests uh, concern film industry, film policies, uh, European, national, and local policies. And more or less uh, 12 years ago, I started to investigate film commissions. I was based in Switzerland, and uh, the Italian speaking area of Switzerland asked me to make a pre preliminary investigation about the existing film commission in Europe because Switzerland wanted to enter this business. And I have to say that that publication, his article just led me to him because I was trying to find some material about film commissions and what, what is a film commission. Uh, for those who do not know, I, I am really lately appointed to that position of, uh, of the Greek Film Center. So I was trying to know more and in a more, let's say, theoretical way, academic way. And uh, what is the difference between film commission and the film office and all this stuff? And uh, his article led him to Thessaloniki Film Festival. So thank you, Marco, for being with us. Thank you. And now, Martin, will you just share your um, really, really exciting <laughs> life with um, us? Uh, my name's Martin Cuff. I am based in Serbia, I'm a Serbian but I'm also British and also South African. And my experience has taken me um, all around the world working with, specifically with government, uh, really, on how to get the most out of the film industry. So um, my background is I started with a film and television market in, in South Africa at the end of apartheid, which was about reintroducing uh, the South African and African film industry and it reintegrated into the global market. I set up the first film commission in Africa, the Cape Film Commission, and I ran the film permit office there as well, um, which is you know, one of the top 10 busiest destinations in the world. And I then moved to Colorado to set up a film commission in Colorado, and they were looking to replace their old film commission with a private nonprofit model. And then I set up to consult around the world, and I ended up in Serbia, where I am currently advisor to the Prime Minister on creative industries and tourism. So, exciting, eh? I told you. So, I have to say that from the uh, European Film, uh, Film Commission, European Film Commission, EUFCN, eh? uh, Network. Commission's Network, uh, our next guest uh, was strongly, strongly recommended, and I'm referring to Teja Raninen, who really, um, who really uh, pleased us and made that favor to travel all over <laughs> uh, Finland and end up here without her luggage. So she will be back without her luggage. <laughs> so uh, Teja is running the West Finland Film Commission. And I would like you to say more about you. 
First of all, thank you so much for for inviting me here. This is my first time in Thessaloniki, and I have fell in love with the city, wonderful city, and so nice to be here. Yes, um, Martin has uh, s such a great <laughs> experience and background, but um, uh, I started as a film commissioner maybe 13 years ago, and I had nothing to do with film before. But I have a background of business development. I've been doing business development in many industries, and uh, especially uh, getting financing for different industries. And um, maybe 15 years ago, um, I was asked from the city of Turku if I could come and, and help them to develop the creative industry. So, so then I started to get financing for creative industries, and suddenly I realized that there was this film commission, and uh, they said that they would like me to develop the film commission, and that's how I ended up being a film commissioner. But I, what I've also done, um, our film commission is part of uh, Turku Science Park, which is a regional business development organization. And what we do, we help all companies. So we have general services for, for, for all industries, but then we have five spearhead industries. And those are maritime, health industry, clean tech, tech, and then experience industry. And I am a senior executive of this experience industry. And uh, what I'm really, really happy about in my work uh, as a film commissioner is that I had the honor of, of being one of the working group members who designed the first production incentive, the national 25% well, cash rebate for Finland. And uh, this is maybe something I will tell you more about later. Thank you. Thank you, Deja. And uh, of course, from, uh, from the beloved destination uh, of Cred, <laughs> uh, we have uh, with us Eleni Bujukalaki. Uh, Eleni is coming mainly from the tourism um, field, which is, again, strongly uh, linked or entity, uh, yeah, up to be linked with, uh, uh, with the cinema and what we are doing here or we are trying to do. So, your turn, Eleni. Well, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Eleni Bujukalaki. Uh, firstly, I would like is to... It, is it on? on? Is it? Yeah, we sorry. Uh, well, let me repeat again a warm welcome. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Eleni Bujukalaki. So, yes, I do come from the incredible Crete. <laughs> And uh, first, I would like to thank uh, the Hellenic Film Commission, Ms. Maria Kukfopoulou and her colleagues, uh, Ms. Jeronimaki and Ms. Sepina for their excellent hospitality. And of course, uh, uh, the Thessaloniki International Film Festival for having us, for inviting us here. It's definitely not my first time here in Thessaloniki, but it's first time uh, uh, in my position as head of the tourism department in Crete, uh, where uh, where I grew up in the beautiful small city of Rethymno, and when I was born, the first luxury uh, resort uh, was built uh, back then. And uh, uh, as a child, during summers, I started working in fish tavern and stuff like that, you know, for uh, some extra money. And ever since I knew that I wanted to work for tourism and do something and promote my island. And so I, tarist, I studied tourism management uh, first. And then I worked for this, uh, the hotel chain, a luxurious hotel chain, which uh, had built that very first hotel when I was born, which is now a, a very famous brand in Greece uh, for f seven years. Uh, and uh, after that, I became a public servant. And for the next 10 years, I had nothing to do with uh, tourism, all you know, but I did uh, study English literature because I'm very much into culture. Uh, I love archaeology, traveling. This is a. Uh, I love foreign languages, which is uh, uh, always has been an appeal to me. Uh, and when I got back to Crete seven years ago, I said I want to uh, do something for tourism. I wanted to promote my island. And um, so ever since then, I'm in the tourism department, in the tourism directorate, which is now uh, responsible also for the film office, for the Crete film office. Uh, under the umbrella of the 13 film offices all over Greece. 
And so in this respect, uh, uh, my main job is definitely to promote create in tourism uh, exhibitions uh, and uh, uh, to host fam, uh, fam trips, press trips, uh, uh, also do marketing campaigns, stuff like that. But also uh, in this aspect, we do uh, try to, uh, we strongly support the region of Crete, the governor, Mr. Arnautakis, ever since the regions were launched back in 2011, the very first promo video of the region of Crete actually was uh, in order to attract film productions. It was called See For Yourself, and the story was like a director is trying to convince uh, a film producer to, uh, to shoot uh, a movie around the world uh, in places such like the Amazon, Thailand, Nepal, Venice, so beautiful areas around the world. And uh, the director, say, the producer says, I want low budget film. <laughs> it's too expensive to do that. <laughs> Uh, it's a nice idea, but not. And he said, we will do that on Crete because the, of the diversity of the place. So the very first video of the region of Crete was a promo video for uh, tourism uh, and uh, we, because we know the benefits of film-induced tourism. And this is I would really like to work on and elaborate further on in the talk with you. And uh, I would like to add, sorry, that it's an honor to be among all these distinguished guests, Mr. Kaff and Mr. Uh, uh, Excuse me, Kuko. Kuko. I'm sorry, Marco, <laughs> and Miss Ejernin, and thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me. We would love to be there with you. <laughs> I mean, you can organize something since your governor <laughs> really loves the whole thing. So just persuade him to support it. Okay. So let's start uh, in our limited time. I do not know if you have the same uh, questions as I do. How did this film commission, my dear academic Marco, <laughs> started? I mean, when when did this uh, this film commissions or or film offices appeared? Okay. Um, first of all, please forgive me for my English. I, I'm not fluent as my <laughs> co-panelists, but I mean, I'm Italian. I will use my hand for expressing what what I have in mind. So um, it's not easy to answer your question because there is not an official history of film commissions. In, moreover, the history of film commission is composed of hundreds and hundreds local histories. So uh, for writing this story, we should collect information, being familiar with uh, um, local rules, uh, local, local uh, administrative systems, foreign languages, etc. So it's a complicated mission, but there is a starting point. According to what I know, to what I discovered, everything started in, the, in Utah, in the United States, in, in the 30s, when a shepherd from Utah went to uh, LA for, um, for proposing his territories as potential location for a Western movie that was on, on pre-production. And he did that because the his territories uh, experienced two huge economic crises, and he perceived film, um, hosting, film shoot, hosting a film shoot as an opportunity for relaunching the local economy. The film company accepted this proposal, and the Western movie Stagecoach has been shot in the territories of this shepherd in, in the Monument Valley, and the Monument Valley became the natural set of Western films. And in order to welcome the huge flow of uh, Western shoots in the Monument Valley, the Monument Valley decided to create a, a film commission. In 1949, it was the Moab Movie Committee. The second one appeared, uh, as far as, uh, according to my, to my studies, in New York in 1975. New York was a key place for shooting film and TV programs, but New York was really very expensive, crowded, shooting there was, was complicated, and many film productions were leaving New York. And in order to stop this, this uh, outsourcing, the major decided to create in 1965 the major's office for film, theater, and broadcasting in order to, not to attract film shoots, but for stopping the outsourcing. So we can consider this film office, we are talking about the film office, as a, as a defensive tool. 
The third one appeared in 1969 in Colorado. Then in 1983, we have the foundation of the um, uh, international uh, network of, uh, of film commissions. As regards Europe, everything started in the 90s. I don't know which is the first film commission in Europe, but I know that everything started in the north, Germany, Belgium, the UK, Scandinavia. And the region that um, introduced the film commission did it for, uh, um, for economic purposes, because the regions were experiencing, uh, 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 I mean, an economic crisis, and they perceived films, uh, film production and audiovisual production as a strategic area with, with, with a huge economic potential. So they, they, sorry to interrupt you, so they, it was the first time they faced it as an investment? Yes, uh, they perceived the film shooting as an opportunity for uh, increasing local employment, uh, for um, increasing tax revenues, for developing uh, skills in related to cultural and creative industries, uh, uh, etc. So supporting cinema was no more... Um, uh, I mean, they, they stopped to, to give subsidies uh, to film production. They started to invest in, in film production for economic purposes. And um, I mean, everything, and after that, um, film commission spread quite quickly in, in Europe. For instance, in Italy, the first film commission appeared in 1997, and in 10 years, the film commission became, became 20. It seems that every region said, well, my neighbor established a film commission, and now they are enjoying economic benefits. Well, I can do the same. Why, why not? And so in this moment, it's quite impossible to say how many film commissions there are in Europe or worldwide. Has the European Union, with any kind of law or law that has to do with audiovisual uh, industry or, uh, or uh, arts, uh, influenced or had an impact on this um, acceleration of, of the creation of uh, film? No, I think no, I think that every started quite spontaneously from from the bottom, um, and not for um, and not thanks to the support of national governments or the European Union. So we basically talk about local public administration that decided to invest in films. Uh, in the past, usually the central government invested money in films for cultural purposes. Now we have basically uh, local governments that are doing that are investing money for economic purposes. And not nationally yet. You're talking about well, local. there are some national film commission. I know that in Switzerland there was a national film commission, but it failed, and now we have local film commission. Okay. So, um, passing the floor to Martin, we, we have already noted the first and big uh, uh, intangible and visible benefit, which is the <coughs> economic uh, benefit, let's see. So, why should uh, we invest by creating film offices? What do they uh, offer? What are the other um, benefits? So I, this morning, once we'd had this conversation last night about what we were going to discuss, I threw together a very quick proposal, uh, presentation. Um, so bear with me, it's not the most pretty thing you've ever seen. I didn't spend a great deal of time designing it. Um, if you could put it up on the screen, that would be great, and then we can rock and roll. Could, there we go. So, I could we keep the microphone going? I wanted to just show this clip. Um, it's from a movie from 2004 called The Last Samurai. And it filmed in New Zealand for Japan. And when you watch it, and I, this has ruined the film going experience for me completely. I watch it entirely now from, the bent, from looking at how local people have benefited from it. And when I look at this, I think, Every single horse that was hired, every piece of bridalware, 
every costume, every piece of um, metal work, every badge, every flag, every, every explosion is stuff that was provided out of the New Zealand economy. And just a simple clip like this, and remember this was set in Japan, so Japan, had they had the right infrastructure, could have had that expenditure in their nation, their area. And one of the reasons that we use this film is it's one of the few that actually gives us proper economic impact assessments of its work. Now, bearing in mind this was in 2004, and 85 million dollars back, um, back in then. But the main thing for me to show you is just look at the range of businesses and uh, economic sectors that have participated in this um, in this activity. Everything from construction to retail to air transport, couriers, insurance. And so it's not even just hotels and accommodation. It's, it really just kicks right the way down through. And I mean, we use this at the sort of the film industry value chain that if you harness the film industry effectively, you can create job opportunities and uh, small business development opportunities right along the way that the film industry operates. And of course, with that opportunity comes the skills development and education opportunity. So you can completely lift the, um, the local economy by focusing on it. Uh, let's go. Um, so I don't know why that went through. Let's just keep going. Maybe I need to aim it up. Um, now, we weren't sure who was going to be in the audience. And so those of you who are filmmakers, I need you to think of these things as the things that you are going to speak to your governments about when you demand support. If you're, if you're from film offices, these are the things that you need to be aware of so that you can take the message forward to your government and get them to support you better. I don't know why this is not changing. There we go. Um, and I'll, I'll rush through this because we've not got very much time. But it's essentially things like, uh, you know, it creates a completely new set of economic opportunities in completely different sectors. When you're looking at it, we had one in Serbia recently, and we were suddenly finding that fur furriers and leather manufacturers and the creation of metal jewelers all across the country were benefiting from the presence of this TV series. Um, and that, of course, attracts new businesses into the, um, into the sector, and that makes the businesses that are already doing those kind of jobs more viable. For government, it makes sure that there's more tax um, circulated, because more business means more taxes being paid. Um, it means that there are stronger institutions. The government needs to be more effective in order to deal with it. I'll show the slide about that just now. Um, the fact that this new business environment is so effective means that new business is created and around it. One of the things that we've used this very strongly for in everywhere I've been has been about positioning of the country, how you send out messages about what your country stands for and what it means. Um, the fact that it's a, a manufacturing on the move means that the econo economic activities are all around the country. Um, Women employment has been a huge thing for the film industry. It's flexible work, so we find a lot of women in the economy. Um, youth employment, it attracts, I mean, in South Africa, we used to find the street kids flying into the film industry, wanting, seeing it on the streets, wanting to be part of it. And of course, in our region, it stops brain drain. So it's, it's really kind of useful for the politicians. And ultimately, it's high, play, high paying green, uh, industrial work that can change the trajectory of a country. Let's keep going. Um, one of the other things it does then, this is a, um, a scene from a 2007 movie, and this is going to take a little while to get going, but I should have fast forwarded at this. Never mind. Um, it's from a movie called I Am Legend, uh, which shot on five nights in New York in 2006. Um, and spent $5 million during the course of those five nights' work. You can see it's a crowd scene as they're evacuating during the vampire apocalypse or whatever is going on there. Um, where it's interesting, as I said, five, six nights, $5 million was spent, 250 crew members and 1,000 extras, including the National Guard, um, striker aircraft, Humvees, boats, helicopters, you name it. And where it's interesting, is that it involved the cooperation of 19 government agencies. 
So for me, one of the things that I get from that is if you say you can't organize that locally, if they can do it, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere, right? Excuse me, Martin. What do you mean by using the word uh, government agencies, 19 agencies? So every single agency listed down there is part of the US either city, state, or national government. And in order to pull off the closing of that bridge, in order to film that scene, they needed to involve all of those people. And on a smaller scale, even in small towns, you'll have you know, local traffic to be able to close the streets, the street cleaning to be able to follow up afterwards. So, but one of the things that we've noticed internationally is if you can pull off this kind of coordination in your government, one of, the, one of the most incredible things for me when I first started was that cities like Atlanta and Sydney had got this film commission stuff off to a fine art, and they were then able to bid for the Olympics because the experience of the government working together had created such a, a roll-on effect that then it became a kind of real benefit to the, to the citizenry. Okay? Um, I know you're going to talk about tourism <laughs> benefits, but I just wanted to, I mean, one of the things that's increasingly become, we call it double pay, double play, double pay, because once the film industry comes and spends all its money the first time round, we've done a lot of work about identifying how film then creates further economic opportunities behind it. And when you see the results, there are thousands of them all over the world, um, you know, we can measure things like uh, increased visitor numbers, increased numbers of site visits, increased business turnover, staff high, bed nights, you name it. Whatever, whatever the tourism industry is measuring, if a film has been there, we can show benefits of that um, quite clearly. Um, for me, it's a very difficult thing. I, I always talk about the um, Devil's Monument in Close Encounters of the Third Kind, which I saw in 1977, and one day I will go. But how a tourism office measures that, I have no idea. But um, you know, New Zealand, which obviously the, the Hobbit is the um, one of the main cases. They reckon that that 13 percent of all visitors to New Zealand go because of the Lord of the Rings trilogy, and spent 630 million dollars on tourism opportunities since 20, 2001, which is significant for a country of five million people, right? Um, I'll rattle through this very quickly. The, there are various benefits of film tourism to the tourism office. They include reduced costs because the film industry puts the, the prices together, the, the visuals together. Exposure, it's a lot longer on screen than a 30 second commercial frequency. You get to see that film again and again. It's on cable and then it's on terrestrial and then it's on video and you name it. Um, we like it because the actors are in it, so there's source association. We want to go where Julia Roberts was. We want to go where um, whatever. We recall it better. It's targeted better. You know, movies are targeted at certain audiences, so um, you can do the same with your tourism product as a result. Personal connection, quality images, and it's non-sales. I mean, that's one of the big things, big benefits of having a film industry for tourism that you're not selling anymore. You're, you're just showing how great it all is. And even the good, the bad stuff, I mean, you know, death on the streets has tourism people. But here's a very interesting thing. And I included reputational benefits for something that really was not a benefit at all. Um, Sex and the City 2, an, an absolutely appalling movie, um, was set in Abu Dhabi. Um, and the Abu Dhabi government said, no, we don't want this. This is not the standard of film that we want. This does not show us in a good light. So the filmmakers shot in Morocco. And I'm not saying that the, the, Mor uh, the uh, um, Abu Dhabi government was wrong to reject this absolutely terrible film. But part of the... What part of the benefit, the opportunity you get when you have a proper film office is that you can manage this relationship much more closely. So you can begin having a conversation with a filmmaker about, you know, that really is not how we do that here. That's not, doesn't re represent us properly. Can you change this? Can you change that? If you've sent them to Morocco, that you've got no control over your reputation at all, and they can really say whatever they want. And obviously from a S Serbian perspective, that's something that we're quite conscious of because for you know, reasons from 20 years ago, Serbia has a terrible international reputation. So for instance, we had, um, we had uh, SEAL Team 
sent the first, uh, filmed the first three episodes of season three in Belgrade. And we threw everything we could at this film simply because it showed the Serbians as good guys. And the benefit to us of having a, um, a, an international TV series seen by millions of people around the world that not only showed our locations and how great it was there, but showed Serbian as, as the good guys in the, in the fight against terrorism was worth every... So we gave them, we gave them military access. They, they had as many military as they wanted. They were landing helicopters outside our parliament building. They had explosions. In fact, this is, a, this is right outside parliament. Um, so, you know, these are, these are our opportunities that you get if you work with the film industry, uh, which you don't have if you don't have a, a, a film office to manage that kind of relationship. Um, and ultimately, one of the other big benefits for all of us here is that it's a growing market. Um, I read yesterday that it, the average European spends 15 dollars, 15 euros a month on digital content, of which 54% is on film and video, which I thought was low, but they reckon that by 2025 it's going to go up to $30 a month. Um, and the average German, for instance, spends nine hours a day using, um, co consuming digital content. And that's a fairly standard figure. So in other words, what we're working in is in a market that is continually going to be demanding more and more content. And if we can then create the structures at a local level to provide ways to access, so filmmakers can make films in our jurisdictions, and we can make sure that more and more people work, everyone benefits. That's it. We have been benefited from you too, from your presentation. And this brings us to Teja, Teja Raninen. How do you handle with I mean, all these things in Finland, and how have you organized yourself in the West part? And please refer to these um, incentives, the local, uh, locally um, offered, which is a different model than the one we have here, or let's say in, in other European countries. Thank you. So first, I would like to tell you a little bit how the, the not the film industry is organized, but the film commissions and the financing bodies. So, so all the actually all the film financing used to be in the capital area. So we have a, a, fin, a fin, Finnish uh, Film Foundation, which is uh, ministered by the the Ministry of Education and Culture, which gives support to national filmmakers, but also co-productions. And then from 2017, we get the, got the first uh, production incentive. And that's operated by the Ministry of Economy and Employment. And they have this organization, which is called Business Finland. So both culture ministry and then, then, uh, then the Ministry of uh, Economics and Employment. And then we have a center which supports uh, audiovisual culture. And that money com comes from copyrights. Then we have six film commissions, so they are like your film offices, and uh, five of them are in mainland, and one is in, we have an autonomous island called Åland, so it's there. But the capital region does not have any film commission. And uh, referring what was said when you said that it was a trend that, that in Europe film commission started, I can say at least in Finland and I think in Scandinavia, it was because of EU financing. So all the regions, they set up these EU projects and uh, not, not all of them were successful because I think that the region needs something. It needs the, profession, the professionals and schools and so on. Uh, to be able to to really really be a successful film commission, but anyway, and then we have regional financing, and in my case, so I'm from southwest Finland, one and a half hours drive from the capital Helsinki, but my city Turku is the oldest one and the first capital of Finland. So when we were under the Swedish crown, uh, our city was the capital. And then the Russians, they, they took it to the eastern part of so Helsinki. But anyway, so we are quite close. And uh, we finance films. So it is in my commission and it's actually in my budget. So I, I run the budget for the film commission. 
And then we have a couple of other film commissions that, that have financing. Either it comes from the city's budget, or then we have these regional councils, and some of the money comes from there. And then we have film commissions which do not finance film. They, they serve the, the films. And in our case, because we are part of business development organization, we, we think about the economical benefits and the employment. And, and we have a very good film school in Turku. So, so one of the, the, the main reasons uh, I think that, that it's very good that we have a film commission is that when the students, they graduate, that they can they can stay in the city and not go to the capital region, which was in the past. They all went there because 95% of the production companies were there. So, so now they can stay and, and set up their companies. And uh, when we finance, I have these rules in the agreement for the productions. And one of the rules is that, that uh, you need to take a trainee. It depends on a project scale, production scale, how many, but you have to take them in because I want that they will get the experience and and then they they get their own network. So that is something what we do. And, and because of the film school, we have a lot of freelancers. So what's good for the for the local community is that that we are not Paris or London or Cape Town. We are a country with 5.5 million people. In my city, it's 200,000 people. So, so it is very important that, that we market the region and we bring the productions in. We bring work for the production companies and for the freelancers. And something else what we do also is that because we are a business development organization, I help the companies. I help them with their business plans. I help them to get financing, not only for their film productions, but also for their business development. Because we have, I'm sure Greek has as well, different kind of uh, business development financing tools. So that is something that we help. And I think one of the major things that 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 what is good for a film commission is is that usually a film commissioner and the film commission has a very wide network for, for in, in internationally. So what I do is I network the companies, I network the freelances, I help them with their uh, skills development. We do talent attraction. Uh, so now there is a huge uh, demand for, for film workers. So what we do together with Business Finland, we try to attract international talents to, to Finland. Telia, you mentioned something last night that you had to do, uh, uh, to do apart from the internship, you are really imposing to the international co-productions, co to the producers who come in yes. and, and cooperate with you. Uh, you referred on another obligation that they should work always with uh, a local producer. Huh? Yes. Uh, I it, mean, nobody yeah. is filming there uh, independently? Uh, well, no. I, I, in, they could in my region, but, but the production incentive, the national one, says that's how we, we made it. You either have to have a Finnish co-producer or then you have to have a film service, uh, the production company. And uh, in, I don't have it in my rules, uh, but, but that, that if an international one comes and they, they want financing from us. But, but the thing is that it, the, the, the financing is depending on the local spend. So I said, mm, this is a good production company. This freelance is really, really good. So in the way, when I make the production agreement, they must have the local ones because that's where the spend comes. But, but I have to tell you that when I started this, I had a little bit uh, difficulties. I started in the business development center. We were merged uh, with another company. I started uh, to develop this experience industry. And film is the, the, the most lovable one for me, uh, uh, what I develop. So I had the maritime industry. You know, we built the biggest cruise ships in the world. And uh, it, it's huge impact, the maritime industry. And then I had this quite small film industry. So I started saying, telling everybody that, you know what? 
a film production is like making the cruise ship because it's all about network it's all about this his huge network and and the product is it can be the cruise ship or it can be a film but the impact that it has the on the local industry and all industries as martin said it's amazing and uh I've, I think that what, uh, why it's so important that, that we have a film office or film commission is, is that, that we, really bring, we really bring in work, we bring in investments, we bring new companies. Bec when I noticed that I have no VFX companies, in Cannes I, I, I sat with this, this uh, British guy and I said, why don't you set up a company in Turku? Because then you can utilize the Finnish production incentive. And he did. And now he has a very successful company there. So, so it is, it's, it's, it's really important. I, I had something can, can I, I was going to say, so say, say one, Martin. One of the other yeah. things I found important about having a local partner, though, was they also have much more deep-rooted network of the people that they can hire locally than somebody who comes in from outside. Often you'll find if the outside film company comes in, they even bring their runners. I and mean, we used to find this in Namibia a lot, mm -hmm. that they would just, par and if, particularly if there's a stronger film center next door. Yeah. So in Namibia, they would bring even drivers up from Cape Town, but the drivers didn't know their way around. So mm -hmm. it was a, actually a, yes. a false economy. Yes. So for me, that was one of the real benefits of having a local yeah. service provider. They know what's so, what. So it became something like mandatory? For In Cape Town, it was mandatory. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but with, with me, it's because I see the auditing. Because that's how the spend comes from my region. So I know who's been hired, what services they have used. They want to use all the services because we are financing them. But one very important thing is sustainability. Uh, I'm sorry, Greeks, but but you know we have the world's largest archipelago. I know that your <laughs> islands are amazing, but us. we have sixty thousand of them. Anyway, so 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 we have to be. I mean, we think about sustainability in all three ways, but 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 we we are very very strict how you film in the in the island area because it's it's so precious to us. Yeah, you just gave the floor to Eleni, <laughs> talking about Island. And what is going on there, Eleni? Well, uh, how, how do you manage that combination yeah. <laughs> with tourism? And, uh, well, um, I don't know how many islets are around Crete, but there are definitely many. Uh, Crete has only uh, a population of 600,010 around, like, according to the last, uh, but welcomes 5 million tourists every year. Uh, and we have a lot of areas that are uh, uh, Natura 2000 areas or protected areas, uh, UNESCO geoparks, etc. So sustainability is a huge issue for us because we have some really amazing places. You must definitely come, Teya. I will show you around. Me too. Uh, <laughs> yes, all of you, of course, of course. And uh, and actually, this is what I wanted to say. That uh, okay, we embark on this journey as a film office. Uh, it, it's uh, it's a new project as a film office but as tourism department we have already been hosting uh, people who want to scout uh, for various reasons around Crete and uh, uh, the benefits I mean Martin did a very good job in thinking about the benefits uh, people do come still come after 70 years to visit the Sorba beach uh, after 60 years after the hit of 1964. And uh, we know that tourism on Crete started in the area of Elunda, Jus Nicolaos, so, um, the French market. Uh, no wonder why, because of the Julie the Stand, uh, the film, the Salute uh, Que so uh, Jesus Crucified, which was filmed there again. Uh, not only because of the location, because uh, because the locals understood the benefits, and uh, uh, Julius Dassen uh, scouted other other areas in Greece, uh, but uh, the locals uh, they made such uh, lucrative deals. Uh, it was the best, the most economic place, the most cheap place to film in all over uh, Europe, uh, um, from what he said. And uh, after that, it's uh, it's the bonds. Uh, it's a bond between uh, 
the locals and the filmmakers. It's the bond between the, uh, the foreign filmmakers and the local industry. Uh, this is what they all say. Even uh, Amini, who directed the two phases of January lately, and who, they co-worked co with two uh, local uh, production uh, companies, he said that he always wanted to do a film in Greece and uh, Crete. Uh, but after that, uh, he just wanted to come back, they, they and the crew, again and again. And, and uh, uh, yes, this is always the case. Uh, and also for people who love films, they do like to visit the locations. I myself, which I'm not the biggest film fan ever, cinephile, I do watch uh, cinephile films. And, but I did go to visit the, the beach for Mamma Mia and uh, the beach in Kefalonia for uh, where the uh, Captain uh, Corellis Mandolin was shot. So in, in this aspect, the benefits are many. Contacting a local film office has to do a lot with networking and connections. Uh, one thing is the funding, okay? Uh, apart from the national incentives, which are operated uh, on a national level from the, uh, from the Hellenic Film Commission, uh, the Greek Film Center, and the cash rebates from the National Center for the Audiovisual Productions and uh, Communication. Uh, locally, uh, when Martin also referred and uh, Martin uh, Marco and Martin, they referred also to local uh, agencies. The government of Crete understands fully the benefits. This is why they invest a lot of money, uh, not only from European fans in order to welcome the, the, the farm troops for scouting, uh, but also uh, for, for the budget needed for the production companies in terms of, you know, we cannot give them money directly, but we, uh, we, uh, we pay for accommodation, the meals, uh, equipment, uh, transfers, etc. And uh, even if they come to Crete and shoot uh, uh, a film which is supposed to be in Syria and people would know that's filmed on Crete, still these people, they have the revenue because they, they eat there, they stay over the night. And uh, in terms of uh, uh, the networking, for example, uh, during the pandemic, a lot of films were shot in Crete, uh, short films, uh, TV series, and uh, the producers said they were amazed at how much uh, the local community was supportive in this aspect. Uh, for example, they, they contacted us because they could not find the extras they wanted uh, uh, for a sh scene in the airport. So they needed a lot of extras. People were then back then afraid during the winter. winter. It was springtime, but still. So I had to personally uh, call my friends, uh, the members from my volleyball team, uh, colleagues, uh, in order to have the people and be able to have a nice scene with a lot of people arriving from the plane uh, and shoot that uh, scene in the airport. So, uh, and not only that, I mean, there are many things I could say in this aspect. We, another, for another film, we were looking for an old truck and we had via Facebook uh, to search all over Crete and via our friends. And yes, we ended up finding the track for uh, the production. So this is actually how the, uh, uh, the local film office can uh, help out in terms of connections to, to mediate with uh, other agencies in terms of funding because we understand the benefits uh, and the government has already uh, uh, promised to support a lot of productions. Uh, currently we have Capitan Mihal has been filmed in Crete uh, and Odeon production, uh, and a long TV series for national TV, uh, The Beach in the Air of Matala, what else? Uh, a short movie by Sofia Exer, who was just uh, wrapped, uh, The Animal. Uh, there's a lot of things going on in Crete, indeed. We just need, uh, to be honest, we would also like to have some, you know, big international, again, some big international uh, films. And the discussion I had uh, early this morning with a producer from Crete was actually that uh, we need to train uh, the local people, the local industry, so that uh, we have more people, you know, for the crew, the technical the stuff, uh, so that we don't, they don't have to bring people from Athens or from everywhere else. We've got the landscape, uh, uh, we've got uh, the accommodations, uh, the resorts, uh, everything in that aspect, because it's our tourist product. Uh, the, the specific uh, uh, crew for the industry, this is something that we need more to develop in Crete and that we will be able to, to provide for more productions that will have, uh, need to shoot uh, on similar time uh, on the island. As we are running out of time, I, uh, I don't know if Thanos is here and we have to be done uh, at 6 o'clock. I would like to ask... Uh, 
Uh, if there is any from uh, someone from the audience who would like to note something or make a comment or ask a question, but please mention your name and uh, uh, your. Uh, uh, Okay, hello everybody. Hi. It's great having you here. And it's very, very exciting for me finding out that every film commissioner is practically doing more or less of the same things. Like all the things that you have mentioned, I am doing as well. I'm Angela Krukidi. I come from the Ionian Islands Film Office. Okay, a lot of islands there as well. <laughs> okay, so just two things. One thing is I would like to share the good news with you. It just came out today that uh, the TV series, Maestro TV series by Christophoros Papakaliatis, well, great people know him. He's a very, very famous and popular director, uh, actor, or producer. Um, it's a nine, nine episode uh, series that was shot in Paxos, which is a small island south of Corfu and Corfu last year. And it has just sold to Netflix. So. Uh, you're going to be able to see it uh, probably around Christmas, I think. So this is huge for us. And I'm just connecting this to what we were saying uh, before, uh, that the huge impact of uh, having audiovisual productions in our regions is that usually we, we pay people to, to shoot uh, advertisements for us. But in this case, people are shooting advertisement for us, and they are paying us. So, good luck, everybody, and all the best from me. Thank you, Angela. Is there anyone else who would like to say something? Yeah, yeah. I would like to say or add something uh, to that. It's really good for, the, for our places and regions, uh, marketing and the attractiveness. But what I faced is also for the citizens of our region and the cities, it's the sense of community that's, I, at least in, in my city, it is so important and they can say, you see, that's just behind my house and you see our cathedral and how proud they are. So I think that that's, that's something and that's why I offer two times a, uh, a year, we have a film day and all the films, they are, they are, um, you can see films in shopping malls, in restaurants, in churches. It's all free for the citizens. And our partners pay it. And that's the thank also because the people are really film friendly, the politicians, but the citizens and the proud, how proud they are of the films, all the films that have be, has been shot there. And the nation brand is built. Yes. That way. But the other thing I liked about the way you describe that, I'm actually working on a, um, a Made in Serbia film festival as we speak, like a weekend where we show all of the films that have recently been made and invite the communities that were... I mean, they've all been on Netflix, but nobody's thanked them. So, um, but what I liked about that film weekend that you talk about is that we all try and promote ourselves as a great place to make films to study film, to participate in the film industry, and therefore to now, you know, this kind of really adds a, an extra layer to it, which I really liked. Mm -hmm. I just want to add that I totally agree with you. It is important to communicate with um, uh, local people, with citizens about the benefits, because sometimes it is uh, uncomfortable to host a film, uh, film shoot. But if people e are aware about the, the, be the benefits for themselves, for their local economy, they will accept this kind of um, uncomfortable stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we went even further because we were having a one point, <laughs> possibly uh, of different sizes, obviously not big feature films, but 50 shoots a day which we were trying to push into a city of just over two million people in a very limited geographic area. Excuse me, uh, are you talking about Cape Town. Serbia? Oh. Cape Town. Okay. And so one of the things that our film office had to do was work and define rules and regulations 
that guided both the community of how this would affect them and also the filmmakers of what they would need to do in order to not tread on the toes of the community. And we created all sorts of programs that allowed that to be managed. We created a, a film unit liaison person who was hired by the film company but reported to me who could say they trampled on the grass and they, you know, so they reported like that. We created a fund in some of the specific areas that the film industries paid into over and above their particular permit fees to help local communities manage their, you know, to renovate the children's park or to put new lighting into the, into the bay. So there are all sorts of things you can, I have, most of my career I found I'm a translator between what the film industry needs and what the government needs. And half the time in the past, they used to talk past each other. And through the film office, you end up being able to find common ground and therefore you, you encourage the investment. And I would like uh, to use your ability as a storyteller <laughs> for our finale. I hope it will be grande because if there is no, uh, there are no film offices, you even get the risk to go to jail. So please tell so us the this story. Is my, this is my favorite, <laughs> favorite story of all of my experiences around the world. I was working for the Peru government and we were looking at how we could create three film offices um, across, across Peru. And one of the places that we were looking at was Cusco and Machu Picchu. Um, in Machu Picchu, there is a, a thing called the Sunstone and it's the only remnant of the Inca religion that still exists. It was the gateway to the underworld, so the gateway to how they communicated with their ancestors. And there is no film commission and film office in Cusco, so just to make clear what's going on here. So the park managers said, okay, you can film, but you're not allowed to bring any heavy equipment. It must just be handheld only. Bearing in mind, when the Spanish came to, to Peru, they destroyed every other sunstone in the country. This is the only one that survived. And what did the film company do? It was Luckily, it was a Peruvian company, and they were making a beer commercial. But they brought a crane into Machu Picchu. And during the course of the filming, the crane collapsed, and it cracked the sunstone irrevocably. It is permanently damaged. It can never be fixed. So global, global patrimony damaged by a film company because nobody's managing it, basically. Um, but in Peru, they take their patrimony very seriously and both the producer and the crane operator are now in jail um, for between eight and 12 years for damaging the patrimony. So this is... Uh... Which I think is a good thing. Yeah. They, they should have listened to me. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so um, one, one more reason for the film commissions to, to be there. So uh, thank you very much. First of all, uh, uh, I thank the audience. We thank you being with us. And uh, Teja Raninen from Finland, Marco Kuko from Italy, Martin from everywhere, <laughs> <laughs> from uh, from everywhere, and Elena Bukalaki from the island of Crete. Uh, thank you very much for being with us and sharing with us your knowledge, experience, and lovely stories. Thank it's you all. It's been lovely to be thank here. You. Thank you. It was you. very enlightening. Thank you.